that's what we got to start with, the secret. 48 years of marriage, what did you have to do to him to make him comply? No. <laughs> I had to teach him to say, yes, dear. As long as he says, yes, dear, I'm happy. Yep. <laughs> Um, listen, we do want to, um, if you have live questions, we'd love to take them. I've got my computer right here where we're going to get that, but we've been taking questions all week long. Dr. Fred and and, and Debbie, y'all might as well buckle up. I can give you as many as 12 plus what anybody else would like to do. If you'll put up the screen real quick, this is how you can ask a question right now in case you didn't already and you would like to ask one. I believe it's anonymous. You can leave that screen up there. And if you have a question as we get going, please ask. Um, But I I love your faith story a little bit. In fact, um, would you tell us a little bit about that? Because I think Debbie's been serving the Lord longer than you, huh, Dr. Fred? Yeah, yeah. yeah. (laughs) I was 16 when I gave my heart. Come on, 16. 16, yeah. I love that. I love that. How how old were you, Dr. Fred? I was older. (laughs) (laughs) Almost 14. Okay. Actually, oh, no, no, no. She was 16. Now, uh, I met her when she was 12, and I was almost 14. That's what it was. Right. So, yeah. And, and and it took a little while before before you gave your life to the Lord, right? Uh, yeah, I was uh, like a, a hippie. <laughs> the late what, 60s, what, Woodstock How would you define hippie? What were you doing? <laughs> uh, I'd rather not say. <laughs> it's a little chemically challenged, to put it that way. <laughs> And then you played music in a band, though, and um, uh, but you two were uh, were together. And um, uh, uh, when did you guys get married? Seventy two. You got that right. Yeah, March eighteenth, <laughs> nineteen seventy. Note, husbands, you got to remember that date, right? right, right, right. I'm stupid, gotta, but I'm not. Dumb. Tell me all your kids' birthdays, Doctor Fred. No, I'm just joking. I got to tell you though, when I was twelve, just getting off of Barbie dolls. Ken, I met my Ken. Oh, this and, is your Ken right here. Right. But um, he, he said to me, I'm going to marry you one day. And I said, <laughs> and it happened. <laughs> I, she, she was 12 years old, but hallelujah. It was, she was, you know, yeah, and I said to her, I'm going to marry you one day. I was just a stupid little kid, but I, God was good. Yeah. Yeah, we don't teach that in our youth ministry anymore yeah, yeah. because my daughter's 11, and so we don't. Right, right. We, <laughs> I'm ready to take Dr. Fred, little Dr. Fred's out if they're doing that. I was almost 13. Yeah, <laughs> almost 13. She okay. likes to say that I was almost I was almost a 13 year old. When I got married, I was almost 19. Sweet. Hey, we already have uh, uh, one live question. Here's here's. Here's the most important live question. It just came in from someone random in the audience, and I thought we could start with this. Why don't you like it when young people button their top button, Dr. Fred? It's ge- it, it, came, it came randomly from someone in the room. It's just not cool. <laughs> and besides, you know, it, you, it, and then if it looks like you're being choked. <laughs> I don't feel like people who wear their top button button are choked. Uh, that need, well, those people would need therapy then. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> no, you look cool. You're one of the few people that look cool on the top button. <laughs> All right, let's jump into some of the questions we had. <laughs> I feel like I'm already in therapy. By the way, <laughs> Dr. Fred has met with my wife and I, and um, we, we love therapy. So I just want to say, um, sometimes therapy has this stigma to it. Like, I can't go there. I, I'm, not, I'm not that jacked up. The first time we thought about it, I thought uh, I would have to be admitting that I'm, I'm really messed up. We got a good thing, right? Honey, we got a good thing. And she was like, we got a good thing. And I was like, well, well but then why wouldn't we make it great? And I think a lot of times uh, just going to see a counselor can really help make a good thing great before it's a bad thing trying to be restored, right? Amen. It's a whole lot easier, I Amen. assume. Uh, I was just going to say I can't confirm or deny that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> All right, let me th- jump into some of the questions. Um, here's what someone said. Since we, have, uh, since we had our two children, uh, we have put focus on our marriage to decide. How do I talk to my wife about focusing on the strength of our marriage and, and where do we start? How important are date nights and, 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 and such things like that? Well, you know, when you get married, uh, it's all new when you're traveling and it's really fun and everything's great and, you know, the sun's shining and it's never raining in your life and everything's good. You have a couple kids 
You have a couple kids and life changes. So you have to really work hard. Whoever has that question, you have to really work hard at this. Uh, it just happens. Kids are, you know, they're demanding and they, they're little kids and they have their own little lives and you're giving your life to them. And so things can become, you know, a little more blasé. You know, you got poopy diapers they take care of and, you know, they're throwing up and their, their immune system isn't... Uh, well, you know, this is kind of jacked up. It's not really, you know, at its height and level. So you're going to catch it. And that's just the way life is. But like anything, you have to, if, 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 you know, anything worth having is worth working for. Okay, so you just have to work a little harder. And, um, and it's, it's a must because some people concentrate on their children so much, and we need to do that, but so much so that they dump all of their time in that, and then somebody's getting a little resentful. It could be the mostly the husband when it comes to something like that. So... Be conscious of it. Talk about it. Um, get some date nights. That's very, very important. Even if you're going out for a cup of coffee and a donut or something like that, that's important. You're away from the environment. The kids you love, but if you're not hearing them scream for a little bit and doing what they do, then it you know, centers you down until you come back into it. Yeah, I'd like to um, say that in, in as rapid as our pace is nowadays, um, and there's so many demands that it is easy to put the marriage to decide if, if you're not intentional. Uh, and, and so a lot of us here, you should have a date night. You should have a date night. It, take some of the mystery out of that. Does it have to be, you know, extravagant, top-notch restaurant every time? What were some of your favorite uh, date nights that didn't cost so much? Or what did you do when you had kids uh, for date nights that you, you guys enjoyed that might inspire some thoughts for us? <laughs> Baby, what do we do? <laughs> no. <laughs> Remember some That's a long time ago. Oh, uh, what did we do, honey? Oh, man, we used to buy pizza. We'd go to the ocean. We were we church planted out, outside of Wilmington, North Carolina. And, you know, for a couple bucks, you get a pizza back then. And you just go to the ocean. You take a walk. You go to the park. You go outside. You go on the, you know, you just take a, you do something. Pack a lunch. Go someplace, you know, and just eat under a tree. You got to do those things. Because if you don't do those things, then you go, well, it's like jogging. You know, honey, you want to work out? You got to work out. Yeah, I'm going to work out. I don't think I'm going to work out about 5 o'clock. Next thing you know, it's coming 5 o'clock. You're still going to work out? Nah, I don't think I'm going to do it today. I'm not going to walk. You're going to walk? Well, it looks like it's cloudy out. You know, I don't think I'm going to walk either. Again. So you, you got to be intentional about this. Uh, and if you do, yeah, in order to get what you've never gotten, you've got to be willing to do what you've never done. So if you do that, you're going to get a benefit from it. And it's very, very important. What you're doing is cha-ching, you're, you're um, investing in the marital bank, right? Amen. Which is what you've done to me. Debbie invests in me in garlic. Because I, I love garlic. This this is very true. I have seen pictures of the amount of garlic she has had to blend up to keep this Italian man happy. <laughs> for what? Per week? <laughs> oh, yeah. It's just, it's a God thing, I think. <laughs> I love he it. Calls it. He calls it Italian cologne. Yep. <laughs> I call it stinky. <laughs> All right. Well, here's another question we had. Um, my husband and I really want our marriage to work, and we have both voiced a willingness to make sacrifices to make it. But I am struggling a lot with trust. We are a blended family, married for less than three years. What homework would you give me to start building trust again? Well, number one, and this is the time for it, I need to find out what trust is. Because trust could mean, um, I don't know, a couple different things. You don't trust him, so why don't you trust him? It's because of the family. It's because of something else that happened. So there's that floating out there in space. Um, but blended families, you've got to realize going, you have to have eyes open walking into it. If you're going to um, have a blended family, and there's multiple blended families, uh, you have to realize you like to think that my child isn't going to take priority or, or his or her child isn't going to take priority. It does. It happens. You don't mean it, but it happens. You try not to do it, uh, but you're always a little protective of your own, you know, genetics. So you have to, uh, there's, just, there's some great, you have to go through counseling. I think it's very good. I've counseled a number of people who have uh, had blended families. You have to be open. You have to be um, pliable. You have to be patient. You have to not, you know, close down on every issue that you have that, um, and, uh, and, and really pray. You have to pray together. I mean, really, you're going to have some issues. You're going to have some tough times. It's When you invoke the name of the Lord, multiple things happen, you know. <clears throat> We're arguing, you know, yeah, your, little, your girl did this and my son isn't doing it. And, and No, no, let's just stop for a moment. If we keep doing this thing, it's going to hurt us. 
Let's talk. Let's look. Let's talk with somebody else. If you do those things, become proactive, it, it does get better. But it is challenging. It's happening more and more, and there's ways to get around that in a better mode. Yeah. So what should the priority be for a blended, <laughs> you know, practically speaking, what are the priorities for a blended family? Should be God first, then what? Well, always God first. Realize before you get married, there, there is going to be issues. You must factor that in. It's not a prerequisite to not get married, but you need to realize if you think, oh, we're going to have a blended family because, you know, you're uh, some, some, I've heard people go, oh, this is so cool, man. We're going to have a blended family. This is going to be so neat. Sometimes that works out. Sometimes that works out. But you need to realize, let's walk into this with eyes open. It's going to be challenging. Yeah. And we ask people prior to that, get some counseling with a therapist that specializes in blended families. And the road is a whole lot smoother because they can go through that and understand what needs to be done, what they need to look for, which really does lighten the load as they go into it. It, it seems like um, if you're single, one of the things you should be looking for in a significant other is like grit and, and just resolution that like um, they're going to be committed come hell or high water because you will grow through tough times. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. You're going you're gonna to have tough times. For the, for the family that thinks, for the couple that thinks, you're not going to have any issues with a blended family. I'll sell you the Brooklyn Bridge for a dime right now. Anybody that gets married, you're going to have issues. Whether they're blended not, or not. Not you two. You, y'all seem way too sweet to have oh, issues. yeah, right. Y'all have issues? <laughs> That's why he authored a book called Struggling Well, right? Right. Do you have issues with me? <laughs> no. no. You're, you're a good guy. <laughs> <laughs> I floss. Oh, <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I floss every day. And hand. leaves the floss Sometimes. on the sink, too, huh? Yeah, there is flosh <laughs> fetish, you know. My wife has floss <laughs> fetish. I gotta have some floss, honey. I, I, I left, you know, I left my floss. I don't have my floss in my purse. How am I gonna make it? I gotta have floss, mate. You just go with the flow. You get a toothpick. It's done. Then... Um, as single people, we are taught to wait for God's best in our lives. Um, if most of us are honest, we have certain standards and expectations etched in our minds of the type of partner we are hoping for. But since uh, since people are human and no one shows up on the scene in perfect condition. How do we balance high standards and expectations uh, like we've been taught with the reality of where people really are in their lives? I think that's a great question. Is that question. the one that's picky? Oh, yeah, yeah. They followed it up uh, asking another question. How do you keep your standards without being too picky? Like, am I, am I being too picky or am I just keeping high standards? Yeah, well, you know, I'm going to tell you, for the gals out there, I can't see you because of the light. You should be picky, in particular today. Um, you need to have a checklist for these guys. Uh, Debbie and I, and I was, you know, Debbie just said she, I needed to know the Lord. Um, I was raised in, let's just say, a large liturgical denomination coming from an Italian family. She was raised United Methodist. And I would just kind of do my thing. You know, I, I didn't understand Protestants and reading the Bible. It was big and black, and you had to read stuff, and they went to the altar and prayed and stuff. I'd just go to a box and confess my sins, and I'm good for another 20,000 miles. So it's, it, it was easy for me. But I remember I was in the Air Force, and I wanted to marry her. And I remember her saying to me, I love you. We've known one another a long time. But but unless you know Jesus and you're walking with him, I can't marry you. That should be the first priority. Because if you don't have that in, a, in, in, a, in someone you're falling in love with, it's going to go downhill from there. Can I, can I interject? Oh, yeah, sure. And, and the, the mistaken thing is I can change him. Mm, yeah. yeah. Never works. Never works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, some by the grace of God, sometimes or that, her or her. Yeah. By the grace of God, sometimes that, that works. But in theory, it doesn't. In other words, you're not going to. I'm going to hope that I'm going to change him when he gets. So you don't want to do that. Check the box. Test the kick the tires. Have at least 24 months that you're dating this guy or gal. Get a chance to know them. Don't settle for something less. Be picky. If you're 35, 40 years old and you're still picky, you might have a couple issues, okay? <laughs> then you might have to walk that through. Maybe you got some anxieties. Maybe you got obsessive compulsive disorder. I don't know what it is. But the fact is, it's good for you to do it because you can't be too picky, I don't think. And if you'll do that and you lay that out before God, God Almighty will give you the guy, will give you the gal that you need. If not, remember I said in the last one, love is blind, but marriage is an eye opener, all right? 
You got to remember that. You know, when you get caught with somebody, you're going, this is not working for me. It's just not the best scenario. Right. Well, and, and I, I was uh, presenting a scenario to you about one of my good buddies in Louisiana who's getting in his later 30s and starting to worry. I thought I was supposed to have high standards, but maybe I'm being too picky. I don't know. Am I supposed to back down the standards? And, and so your advice would be what? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> good to be picky, but if all of a sudden you find you're 30, 35, 30, 33, 35, 40 years old, and you're still being picky, there may be something, you know, maybe, maybe God brought that guy or gal into you, and you just heard the boat, you know, go out to sea. <clears throat> There's might be, there might be reasons why you're not, you, you may have a, an infinity against relationships. <clears throat> Some people <clears throat> will talk they're okay until the person begins to talk about marriage. And when they talk about marriage, I've counseled people like this. <clears throat> Excuse me. They all of a sudden find I, I'm freaking out and I'm, um, I'm anxious because now this is going to change my life. When in, indeed they might have an anxiety disorder of some kind. And you have to address that. Not everybody, but some people. So if you're too picky at, and you're 50 years old and you're going, I'm still looking for him or her, uh, you might not have anybody you might just you and jesus and and you know hopes and dreams as an example well let, let's uh let's talk a little bit about relationships um and talk this one out i had a question um uh proposed this week does it matter to god who i sleep with i, I warned you all pg-13 so you know if you still got kids in here you might want to cover their ears but i want to let the doc be real with us It, it, it seems like in our generation, some of that's like less and less important. Like, oh, well, that's just like old school rules. Does it matter who I sleep with? You better believe it does. Um, what does it say in Genesis 2 and Ephesians 5? I believe it's in Matthew 19. For this reason shall a man leave his father and his mother, cleave to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. No longer two, but one in what God has joined together. Let no man put asunder. <clears throat> so God wants you to be married. Uh, uh, sexual intimacy is designed, handmade in holy matrimony. It's designed by God physically, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually to be wrapped in that wonderful, um, <clears throat> that wonderful gift that God gives you in covenant, not outside of covenant. Because if it's outside of covenant, it's just an act. And, and it's self-pleasing. Now, are there people that do it? Yes. Some people go, oh, come on, you know, Jesus still loves me. Yeah, he still loves you. But you're messing your life up, and you're messing your head up, and you're messing your tomorrows up, and you're, and, and you're, you're having a lot of regrets in, in, in years gone by. My, <laughs> my, my, my crazy aunt. Everybody, anybody have a crazy aunt? <laughs> she used to say, you lay down with dogs, you'll wake up with fleas. All right, so you need to, you know, you got to watch. You don't want to do that. That is a very special thing. And if you wait, I'll tell you that. Can we say this? I guess we can. Full disclosure with us. Oh, I don't care. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so I was a hip. I mean, I don't care to a point. Okay. All right. Yeah. Just slap me in the back of the head if it doesn't work again. Um, so I was, I was raised, you know, in the denomination I was raised, and I was a hippie, and I was, a, I was chemically challenged during those hippie days, Woodstocking days, and I played in a bunch of garage bands, and, you know, some of you baby boomers there are still, and it said anybody that remembers the 60s wasn't there <clears throat> for the most part. But um, I gave my heart to the Lord in 1970 when I was in the Air Force. I had multiple, multiple times to be sexually uh, uh, active in that kind of a lifestyle, that lo you know, free love and drugs and all that stuff. And Debbie did. Debbie was, you know, wasn't that way. She was, you know, very, she wouldn't sniff a beer bottle cap. She would she was president of her class. She was homecoming queen of her high school. Come on. So, um, Come on. They'd look at her, and I was long hair, and you're like, eh. they'd look at her and look at me and go, what the heck? What are you dating this guy for? <laughs> Uh, I said that to say this, I don't know, something, I just couldn't do this. I was, we got married virgins. And um, now I know 
God, you know, for those of you, those who have been sexually active, when you come to Christ, God, you know, changes all of that in you. And there's no condemnation here. None. I'm just simply saying it is possible. Yeah. You yeah. don't have to give in to this. Yeah. God has come called on. us to be individuals. Yeah. You are not what you do. You are who he says you are. That's good. And so for those who have been involved in it, there's always forgiveness and agape and love, and it's done with with God. But those who are continuing to be in that kind of a state, it is not God's best for you. His best is to find that certain person and then enjoy all of that and more. And by the way, I'll say this, Pastor, it's not just about, oh, I'm getting married so I can have sex. Wow. Don't get married then, okay? <laughs> because that's you don't want to just use that person. Be, there's affirmation, there's love, there's kindness, there's validation, there's care, feeling valued and important. And those things make up a relationship that make sex, and it's not sex, it's then making love because you're in covenant with that. It takes on a whole new realm, and God Almighty meets you, and life becomes much, much much more for, for, for more fulfilling. Come on, come on, that's good. Yeah, y'all can give it up. He, here's another one. Um, what do you What do you do when you change how you? De- this is a, a married couple saying. What do you do when you've changed the way you deliver a message to your 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 spouse about an issue or something, but the person still doesn't respond? Like they never see their contribution to the matter. It's always my fault. Is how I'm interpreting how I'm interpreting it. How do you speak to a brick wall? <laughs> how do you speak to a brick wall? <laughs> you know, I can almost, we can always do some therapy right here. Okay. You know, like the, I'm thinking the other day when you, uh, what do you want me to do something? We're moving because we have to get up there to, to the Bible college. And, uh, and you said something to me. Well, he has a little bit of ADHD. So you kind of have to look him in the eye and ask him to do something sometimes because his, <laughs> he's over here in Jupiter somewhere, somewhere over here. So I don't know what I asked him, but sometimes he doesn't hear. So, But I think that the answer to that is when, when we begin to take ownership for our issue, it, you know, if we think that it's all him or her, then we got a lot of things to learn. So, and some of us are more stubborn than others, so it takes a little more effort. But I think if we open our hearts to, to Christ and say, okay, what, what's my part in this? And we ask the Lord to help us and show us our heart, then, um, then I think some stuff can happen, good stuff. Uh, yeah, if I may, Pastor, just to kind of build on that. <clears throat> okay, so we're, we're, you know, we're, Hopefully this will answer the, the question as well. So we're moving. We got a lot of stuff, and you know we're all doing a bunch of stuff. And she wanted something done, and I wasn't doing it timely enough. And she was, you know, you got to do this, and remember, you got to do that. And I'm thinking, well, I got other things to do too. You know, I got stuff around the house. I got this. I got stuff around the office. But I think that number one factor, and honey, you can you can you know have at me if, if it's not true, is you've got to stop. She said ownership. You've got to take ownership. You've got to stop, and you've got to consider. But you've got to listen. More people want to talk than listen. You know what I mean? I'd, they'd rather talk than stop and listen. Sure, I, I have a little ADHD. I've been around the world already. You didn't even know it. I've been all over the place. Um, and and uh, But the fact is, if I'm not listening to you, then I don't know what it is that you need or what you want, or I can't consider, or I can't ask the Holy Spirit to help me to you know, to connect with you. It may even be like sometimes you would, I'd say something to you and, you know, you'd, you may be, you know, get in your defensive position or me and later we come back. We'll come back and we'll go, you know what, God's been speaking to me. You're right about that. I'm sorry, a lot's happening. And if, if you're not open to that kind of thing, then you're constantly, constantly going to be in your defensive position trying to get the other person to realize that they're wrong and you're right. You keep that up and all of a sudden, you're going to start some emotional abandonment. They're not going to want to talk with you. You're just going to often do your thing and the other thing. So you have to be open. You have to be build your boundaries. You have to be take ownership, and you have to listen. To yeah, I, we had a question come in about communication that, you know, we've been married for a, long, um, a, a number of years, but anytime we want to talk about things, uh, the, the spouse starts to shut down. <laughs> How do I get someone who's not listening to listen um, is is Basically, the question I'm hearing: How, how do we change that? Yeah. Go ahead, therapist. Therapist. Get them to listen. Um, I give them drugs. 
No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Medication, not drugs. <laughs> no, not at all. I'm only kidding. Um, some people, it depends on how you were raised. If you're raised in a family system where mom and dad didn't listen, uh, they don't listen to one another, um, there's no affirmation or validation or care or expression. And what you're doing is you're learning from them. And so you watch them try to resolve issues. If they don't resolve issues, actually all those issues go under the carpet with the other 2,396 that were never resolved. Then the next issue you have that comes up, it becomes this issue plus all of the other ones have to, to match it because they've not been resolved. So you have to stop and go, if I'm not listening and I find I don't like that process and it's difficult for me to open up, there may be something like melancholy in, in a temperament. And you have to realize, well, you know, I don't like to talk because I internalize things. But also, I have the power of God in my life. We're not just subject to our yeah. genetics. Yeah. I, have, if I, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So if I stop and I go, all right, Lord, I don't naturally get this. My parents don't like this, but I'm with my spouse, and I don't want to continue to repeat the game here. So I'm asking you, Lord, to do something in my life because I'm stopping. I'm taking time. I'm asking you, and you said you would not disappoint me. If you become that connected with God, that connected with wanting to do the right thing, then you will change. Not completely, but you will, you will change, right? If, if I might. Maybe the difference between our families, you know? Well, well my family was very um, tense, and they held everything in. They never expressed themselves. His family was crazy. They beat one another up <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, yelled and screamed. So, of course, when we got married, I was, what's wrong, honey? Nothing. And he would try to pull it out of me, and um, and obviously I needed to, sh to share my my thoughts and feelings, but it was hard because we never did that in our family. So um, I had to learn. And I was also sharing with Jessica out there, um, it took me a little while to process my thought. You know, like he can put things into words real quick. I can't do that. I have to think about it. And so um, we learned that, you know, let's come back in 24 hours and talk about this. And then I'd have time to think you know, and, and figure out what, what, what I was feeling and or even write it down. So that, that helped us a lot. There's yeah. ways to do, do that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, some people internalize. Mm -hmm. it, it depends on your ethnicity, too. Like with Debbie, she has a German background. I have an Italian background, so we're crazy. And um, she's, Germans are, you know, they, they internalize. They're very good. They're very hard workers and all this stuff. And it just depends on your background. What's that? What you love. Oh, I, <laughs> hard, I'm hard worker. worker. Yeah, I'm hard worker. Debbie is a hard worker. She's she works hard worker. much harder than you, Dr. I know. I, 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 she does. I mean, I don't know. It's something about manual labor in me. I, we've never been real friends. <laughs> um, but I need, I work, yeah, I, I need to do more of that. But, but if you, <laughs> um, but um, you're right. She'll internalize and I can open up more. And it took a while, right? You know, we yes, it did. It took a yeah. while. I have to stop yeah. and you have to go, look, I don't do this. Get away, write a little bit, mm -hmm. think a little bit, mm -hmm. and you come back and it does help. We mm -hmm. need to do these kind of things. Can we give it up for uh, Dr. Fred and Debbie? We so appreciate you too. Come on. We, uh, we're, uh, we're about to close, but I, I really want to give it up for them one more time. Come on. Honor them well. Thank you so much. Listen, Dr. Fred.